Hi guys, this is gsnl.com and I'm here with a rugged phone. It's called the Cat S52 and we're here for a full review at last. So, this handset was unveiled in 2019, but it's still pretty fresh. The latest offering from Cat, which is a brand spawned by Caterpillar, you know, they make bulldozers and also some heavy boots, but also rugged devices. It's a single camera mid-range phone that's focused on being rugged resilient to the hardest of elements from nature from your drops from everything that could happen to the phone now the handset itself is priced at 600 dollars right now and uh, surprisingly enough the camera at the back has a sensor borrowed from the google pixel 4 but more about that later so let's talk about the design first of all this is a rugged and ultra resilient phone although you wouldn't tell that's because CAT made it more supple, lighter and slimmer than usual. It's got a TPU back, the TPU material is also used for cases, and a pretty rough and tough metal frame with these screws to hold everything together. There are two textures here on the TPU back side and everything is glued tight together. And even though it's water protected, it doesn't have a lid on this port here or on this one here. So that's a plus. It's obviously IP68 certified. It can be dropped on concrete from up to 1.5 meters in height. And uh, let's see what else. The sides are obviously covered in aluminum and the thickness is 9.7 millimeters. The weight is 210 grams. And as far as the rugged phones go, this is pretty compact. I would also have to praise how grippy it is. It has a pretty solid grip on account of the texture at the back and also a pretty nice textured power button here that helps you find it in the dark. Other than that, it can take drops. It's certified in the military standard 810G. It's got a thicker than usual Gorilla Glass at the front. And well, that's about it. It's a robust, although at first sight, you wouldn't be able to tell. And also the frame is a bit higher than usual. So if it falls on its face, it will not damage the screen. Now, speaking of screen, this one is a 5.65 inch IPS LCD panel with a resolution that's 1440 over 720 pixels. Also, we got Gorilla Glass 6 protection just in case you're wondering. Now, uh, the viewing experience is going to be shown to you right now because we have a test video. So, 5.65 inch HD screen and this is the sample we're working with. Okay, so first impressions, a pretty crisp image, rather colorful. It's a bit whiter than usual on account of the black snow be not being so black. Wide view angles and a pretty decent contrast even in a full sunlight. And once again, a pretty bright and crisp screen for an HD display. Now, we obviously went to the trouble of doing all the famous tests. So this is what the pixel arrangement is like under the microscope. It's of the RGB stripes variety. And we also did a brightness test with a lux meter and achieved a top level of, let's see, 496 lux units. What this means, you're going to see right now. Okay, so we surpassed phones here like the Samsung Galaxy A70 and at the same time the Huawei Mate 20 Pro, but we stayed below the iPhone 11, OnePlus 60 and even the Cat S61, which is a, was a bit of a bombshell with 603 lux units. Otherwise, the screen is pretty solid for this rugged phone and offers settings like adaptive brightness, display size, font size and of course a glove mode since people who buy this phone are probably going to have gloves. Now, if you're wondering about the rest of the hardware, what we're dealing with here is uh, a pretty bright screen. So let's turn it down a notch. Now, what we're dealing with here is a phone that resorts to a Mediatek Helio P35 CPU, an octa-core chip at 12 nanometers in architecture. And it's also uh, clocked up to 2.3 gigahertz. The GPU is of the PowerVR GE8320 variety, and we also get 4 gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage plus micro SD card slot. Now, uh, I even installed some games here, the basic ones. It's definitely not a gaming phone, but also it does not suffer from lag. So that's a big plus. I ran apps fine, I did some updates fine and had zero problems with stutter, lag and all that. So you can forget about any sort of trouble on the device performance wise. Speaking of performance, we also did a bunch of benchmarks. So let's see how those panned out. 
Okay, so we go here, and this is on 227, where we beat the Sony Xperia XA2 Ultra and the Motorola Moto X4 plus the Huawei P20 Lite, at the same time scoring below the Samsung Galaxy A40 and Galaxy A20e, which is definitely not a compliment, and also below the Cat S61 by a few points, Xperia XA2, Nokia 6.1. Okay, so the overall impression is that we have an okay performance for a lower mid-range phone. Now we also did a bunch of temperature tests and let's see how those came out. So here you can see a heat map of the phone and you can also see some of the temperature it achieved. So basically uh, when it comes to the benchmarks we got as high as 29.2 degrees Celsius which is not bad. In games we got to 38 degrees Celsius so uh, that's rather hotter but only in games and once again it's not a gaming phone. Also couldn't exactly feel any overheating so you're safe. Now on the battery front people usually bundle a big battery with a rugged phone. It's not the case here, it's a 3100 mAh unit, which one would fear it's not satisfying enough for this size. Let's see how we did in our tests. We start with the video playback and here we achieved 10 hours and 51 minutes of continuous HD video playback. Here we go, 10 hours and 51 minutes on the dot. And uh, this means that uh, it's a pretty solid result we're beating the Nokia 8.1, we're also defeating the Asus Zenfone 5, staying below the Xiaomi Redmi Note 7 and the Samsung Galaxy A20e, and at least a hundred other phones out there. The fact that we're close to the OnePlus 6 is, I would say, a bit of a compliment. Continuous usage has us at 10 hours and 52 minutes. That's the actually impressive side of the test for the battery. It beats the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus and the Xperia 1, which are both flagships, but stays below the major mid-rangers, Galaxy A50, A70, and even the Cat A61. The charging, I would say a bit on the long side, 2 hours and 14 minutes, but at least after 1 hour you're at 68% should be, I would say, enough for you. The usual stock battery saver features are on point here. Speaking of things that are all on point, singular speaker at the bottom, not the most fortunate placement, it's very easy to cover it with your hand when gaming or watching a video, very easily muffled and covered. Okay, now the actual experience, uh, it should go something like this. Okay, so the muffling happens, but not as much as you'd expect. The sound is pretty loud and clear, even the bass was satisfying, I didn't notice any distortion, the high notes were okay, and it gets hugely loud in games, believe me. So we also have an audio jack at the top, we also have FM radio in case you're wondering, and the equalizer is the stock one from Google Play Music. Um, I also did some other tests involving a decibel meter and the results are pretty good. 88 decibels with our typical test sample. It's superior to the Motorola One Macro, uh, Xiaomi Redmi Note 8 Pro and the Galaxy S10e. Stays below the Samsung Galaxy A70 and the Xiaomi Redmi K20 Pro. Now the other result was the really impressive one. 104 decibels in gaming. Oh boy, if this were a gaming phone, but it's not. This is actually the 10th placed phone from the hundreds we've tested, beats Huawei P30 Pro, and the Huawei Nova 5T as well as the iPhone XR. So in the end, not a bad set of acoustics, despite the placement of the speaker. On the camera front, I don't have many words to say here. Things aren't complicated. Singular 8 megapixel camera at the front and singular 12 megapixel camera at the back. F1.8 aperture, single LED flash, dual pixel face detection autofocus and full HD only video capture. Now the sensor you're seeing here uh, is the same one from the Google Pixel 4 and to be honest Google has been using the same sensor on Pixels for a while now, that's maybe the reason. Now the thing that baffled me is how simple the interface is for the camera. You only get photo, video and portrait, that's it, there's no other mode, only photo, video and portrait. I know it's not a phone for pictures but still. Uh, more options wouldn't hurt, although you can easily fix that by downloading another photo app. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about the camera samples. As you can notice, I've taken quite a few pictures, uh, even selfies and even bokeh shots, because why not? And I will tell you my findings right now. So, they were taken in early December, 
2019 as you can see it was a clear and sunny day in spite of a fur tree dressed up for Christmas now things I notice here is that the colors are okay okay calibrated but every once in a while you'll notice a bit of over processing and also a bit of yellowish hue which will appear on top of your image now the selfies were I would say decent maybe something like a Sony mid-range phone from two years ago and here you can already start to see some of that yellow I mentioned which is sinking into the image a bit. One of the best aspects is the fact that the HDR really works here uh, when you need it. Okay, several more shots. Don't get me wrong, the clarity is top notch. So if you want clarity, it's okay. Even the details are decent, uh, but don't expect too much zoom here. So the power of zoom is pretty limited. Okay, and the separation of planes in bokeh is actually quite decent. This bear is properly separated from the blurred background. Okay, we go further. Um, we also tried out a selfie here. Decent separation of the planes, but once again, as I've seen on many other phones, the headphone wires got caught in the whole blurred bokeh thing. Okay, so even more shots here. Bunch of selfies, a regular selfie, a bit dark. Bokeh selfie, as you can see here, a blur towards my headphones. One of the bugs I've seen many, many times in portrait shots but overall for an 8 megapixel camera or a mid-range phone i would say i'm pretty happy with the results when you really get proper lighting proper sun you can pull off some very nice and vivid colors and also i've taken some pretty solid close-ups as you can see in the end a decent camera uh, since it's one of the few single camera phones i've tested in 2019 is definitely top five if not top three material among single camera phones now let's talk about the low light capture in the end, it's no iPhone XR, but I feel it can maybe fight the lower mid-range Motorola Moto G phone, for example. Now, I was talking before about the low-light pictures. To be honest, they're not that bad, even though some of them are yellow and a bit blurry. Now, if you keep the camera stable, you can actually pull off some decent shots, but I wouldn't go further than decent. Actually, the clarity is quite okay, but every once in a while, there's one that's too yellow or too blurry. The brightness is, I would say, okay for the low light capture. The street light halos are kept in check. I'm talking about measurement wise. And we even face some light sources in a proper manner. So overall, a mixed bag. Sometimes it's actually good. Sometimes it's, well, a bit blurry. The flash shots are okay, and the clarity and brightness are decent. Now, if you want to talk about the video, uh, we also got you covered because we have a special app to play them, the MX Player. So we have a sum total of five videos. Things are pretty straightforward. So four during the day, one during the night. Here we go. MP4, full HD, 28 frames per second, 17 mega per second. And the first video goes like this. I'm going to mute it on account of the carols heard in the park. Now, let's turn the brightness up a notch. Okay, so things I noticed here, a bit dark and also uh, sometimes a bit overexposed, especially the background area. Poor zoom, losing details rather fast. Noisy shots, especially if you look at the branches of the trees, which will start to meld into each other at some point. Decent colors, but not as good as the photos. A bigger tendency to overexpose and oversaturate, sometimes even overprocess. I found the reds to be okay. They're not pink, they're not purple, they're just reds. Exposure change happens in an okay fashion when panning. But in the end, it's not the most memorable full HD video capture I've seen on a mid-range phone. It fits somewhere between the Huawei P20 Lite and the P30 Lite, I would say. Perhaps, even though it's overexposed, it's not as overexposed as the Huawei P20 Lite. That's during the daytime, comparable to best case scenario, Motorola Moto G6, maybe. Uh, now, low light video capture, as expected, blurry, yellow, a bit too vivid for my taste, rather noisy, and if you're moving, walking and filming, there's that annoying flicker. Big street light halo, so definitely a no-no, you're better off leaving the phone at home if you're filming during the night time. Now, we're done with the camera. Uh, speaking of single camera phones, I would say it's comparable to the Motorola Moto G7 Power. Uh, that one has a single camera, but that one can film in 4K. So that's the difference. This one can't. On the connectivity front, I already mentioned the USB Type-C port at the bottom. We got dual SIM. We even have NFC for payments. 4G LTE, 
uh, GPS, Wi-Fi dual band, Bluetooth 5.0, Galileo, GLONASS and BDS for global positioning. Now, um, we also did a bunch of speed tests, but before those, I have to mention that the calls were pretty loud and clear on this phone. Here are the tests and to be honest, their flagship level. Uh, the 4G one got as high as 208 mega per second in download and uh, 68.1 mega per second in upload. Not bad at all. So that's 4G. When it comes to Wi-Fi, 247 mega per second downloads and up to 25.2 mega per second uploads. Once again, not bad at all. And we're done with connectivity. On the OS front, it's Android Pie with a pretty stock UI, which means the leftmost home screen is meant for your stories, news, updates for the weather. Multitasking is done like this, with this endlessly scrolling horizontal carousel and the apps here. Of course, there's also split screen, which is, as usual, annoying because you're doing it like this and like this. Okay, so we're done with the multitasking. The experience is stock. They haven't tweaked any of the icons, any of the options here. Let's see the widgets. Also stock, so cat has not messed about with the software. Swiping down reveals notifications and quick settings, which have this uh, gray and green hue. You also have a cast option, NFC, and these are the settings. Once again, stock and vanilla. Battery, display, sound, security, accessibility, and digital well-being. Part of the experience is the security here. This is the first cat phone with a fingerprint scanner at the back side. And to be honest, it's pretty snappy. So check this out. Just tapping it once unlocks it. Here we go. Okay, and I have another finger memorized, this one. As soon as I put it here, it does the unlocking. So it's fast and accurate, no objections here. Okay, so cover the software. Let's see the pre-installed apps. Stock stuff, Drive, Facebook files, Duo. Uh, there's also Instagram, Maps, Photos, the Play Suite, Settings, and of course also a toolbox, which is basically a fancy way of, well, it's a gateway between yourself and parts of the App Store, the Play Store, which include manly apps, so to say. We got farming apps, we got fishing apps, hunting apps, architectural apps, engineer apps, and whatever else people who use rugged phones may want here. Also Skype and Instagram, just so you know. So, we're done with the review. It's high time we accessed our own website and gave you the conclusion about this device. Now, I have some uh, interesting stuff to tell you on the pros and cons. So, on the pro side, it's a tough phone for sure. With a bright screen, it's comfy and it's got a good grip, solid battery and a pretty bright screen, loudspeaker at the bottom, especially in games, for some reason. It takes a pretty nifty HDR, not bad selfies, if I'm being honest, fast connectivity, and also stock user interface and a fast fingerprint scanner at the back side. Those are the pros. On the cons, well, performance was a bit underwhelming, not very impressive. Singular camera at the backside. Camera interface is way too simple, too few options. The zoom is poor, even by these standards. The pictures are a bit yellow at times. And also, uh, video capture should have been just a tad better. In the end, you're left with a rugged phone. Now, the anecdote about this phone is as follows. I know it has specs uh, for a $150 phone and they sell it at $600. What's the catch here? The catch is that if you're buying the $150 phone and you're working in tougher environments, you're going to be dropping them and breaking them. So instead of paying 150, you're paying 150 times two, times three, times four. Instead, you buy this one and you make a singular purchase and that's it. And this time Cat wanted to offer you a phone that's also good looking enough to not be a brick. So you can take it to the pub after you're done foraging, cutting trees, working on a chemical plant, in a mine. That's the target audience for such a rugged phone. You can take it, you can smash it, you can drop it on concrete, in water, in the tougher conditions. It's got military certification. At the same time, it's still an Android phone, which can offer you a good time in the multimedia department and, of course, some social networking. So that's the core, you're sparing expenses on the other phones with similar specs which would break three or four times in a month. This is it from us, this has been the review of the phone CAT S52. Bye bye.